So I'm going to talk about anti-exceptionalism and metaphysics. It's a very big picture and very, very sketchy um, talk. So don't expect like magical things to happen. Um, I'm going to start out by reading three quotes. And after I read the second one, I will say something briefly about the talk. Um, so the first quote is from when I was in graduate school and I was like really struggling with trying to formalize something. It was genuinely very hard. Um, I was working with Hans Halverson on this thing and we couldn't do it. And I started crying in his office. <laughs> and then he was like, Michaela, don't be ridiculous. Don't worry about the formalism. We can formalize anything as long as we change enough rules, which is true. Um, OK, so the second quote is from Timothy Williamson. And he says, logic and metaphysics overlap. Appropriately interpreted, different logical systems form the structural core of different metaphysical theories. The choice amongst such theories is to be made by abductive standards, similar to those in the rest of science, inference to the best explanation, where explanations need not be causal and may involve understanding particular cases by bringing them under more general patterns in illuminating ways. The relevant theoretical virtues include elegancy, simpli elegance, simplicity, strength, explanatory power, and consistency with what is already known. Um, some metaphysical theories are so informal that it is quite unclear what they entail. Whenever an opponent claims to draw false consequences from them, a proponent has the option of denying that they really follow. Sometimes metaphysicians seem to reserve the right to make up their theory's consequence relation as they go along. This has the advantage of rendering their theory hard to refute, but the disadvantage of undermining its predictive power. OK, so I just want to briefly pause and say, um, you will not get what was promised in the abstract for this talk, <laughs> which was like deep problems for anti-exceptionalism. Um, instead, you will get uh, me saying some things about how I think about anti-exceptionalist methodology and something that I sort of think, or a cluster of things that I think are a mistake in the methodology. Um, whether anyone is actually doing those things, though, is a different question. So it's a little bit unclear, for example, what Williamson is really doing um, and how much I'm disagreeing with him or not. Um, so I excised all of, <laughs> all of my discussion of Williamson from the talk <laughs> and decided to just talk about what I think. Um, the last quote is from someone who everyone would be very surprised by, who stood up in the middle of a talk I was giving and started screaming at me <laughs> that I had no idea what I was talking about and was deeply confused. Um, and this was because I suggested that logic's job might partially be trying to get at something about mind and language independent reality. Um, OK, so I think I am really confused but there's a typo right here. I don't think I'm any more confused than everybody else. Um, and the talk is kind of just a first pass at trying to work through that confusion. Um, OK, also this handout is a remnant of giving this talk to a general audience. So I'm going to skip over some things that we've talked about. Um, so anti-exceptionalism and data. Uh, I won't read this quote from Ula that every single person <laughs> It's red. I'm just going to skip over it. You all know what it says. Um, it's the summing up of the anti-exceptionalist view. Um, but I do want to talk about some questions to keep in mind, um, some of which we've talked about. So the first question is just like, what is anti-exceptionalism a claim about? And sometimes when I read people, I get the sense that it's really a claim about the epistemology of logic only. Um, or something about sort of methodology and epistemology, but not about anything else. Um, and I think this is important because I'm going to sort of roughly gesture at the end of the talk about a reason to think that it should be a claim about more than that if it's a claim about logic. Um, OK, what's the method? Lots of people think it's abduction. Um, and then what's the data? What is it? And what is it that we're trying to explain? So a common answer is we're talking about validity, and the data is whatever is relevant to that. Um, but I do want to suggest that like there are all sorts of different questions we might be asking. Um, so 
I take theories to be answers to questions of the form like who, what, why, where, when, how. Um, and there are many, many questions that we might be asking um, about logic, and I'm going to talk about some of them. Okay, so uh, some of this section of the paper is just stolen from your paper. <laughs> some of it's not. <laughs> it's a big mess. Um, okay, so here's some options for what the data might be. Empirical data about the mind and language independent world, um, which might be like data of the kind that we use in the natural sciences. Um, or if you think there's metaphysical data, whatever that means, it might be that. Um, empirical data about the mind and language dependent world, which might be like data of the kind we'd use in the social sciences, psychology, linguistics. Um, linguistic intuitions, metaphysical intuitions, intuitions about validity, mathematical theory and practice, scientific theory and practice, um, descriptive data about how we reason. If you think there's such a thing as normative data about how we ought to reason, then that can go in there too. Um, point is just there's a lot of different sources of things that we might be thinking about. Okay. What are we trying to explain? Um, the first thing I want to suggest, and this will become a little more sharpened as I go on, is that we maybe don't have a reason, any kind of motivation to try to get a single logical theory that can accommodate all of these kinds of data. Um, the question we need to ask ourselves is what is the question that the theory would be an answer to? Um, I should not have this parent, sorry, ignore this parenthetical remark on your handout. So plenty of people might have answers to this, like if they think the question is about validity. Um, but I don't think that it's so obvious that there is a single question that we can be asking. Um, OK, so one thing is I'm not sure what the motivation is for asking such a question. So you think about like the natural sciences for a minute. Um, I think we have some kind of motivation for coming up with like a unified natural science theory. And I think an, a, an important sort of um, reason that we have that motivation is even if you're not like a reductivist or an eliminativist about the relationship between like biology and chemistry and physics, you think, you should think, <laughs> There's some sense in which all of these theories are about the same stuff, right? They're about like different levels of the same stuff, but they're all about sort of physical stuff. They're not about the same things, but they're about the same stuff. Um, so we might be moved to come up with a kind of complete scientific theory because we want to explain why the sciences aren't independent, even if we don't think it's like a complete reductive or eliminative relationship. Um, given that their subject matters aren't independent. Um, I don't think there's any kind of dependence of this kind between the various sources of data for theories of logic. Um, so this is just me being like, I'm not sure what the motivation is. Um, then there's this issue of like, if there is a good theory, it's going to be really general. Um, and plausibly too weak to like do a lot of work for us. It's all related to stuff we've talked about, but I realize I'm talking about it in very different terms than everyone else. Um, okay, so if our questions are just about validity, then maybe the answer lies there. The, the, the glue that holds all this data together is the validity question, um, and somehow it's all relevant. And I want to suggest um, that that is not the right way for the anti-exceptionalist to go, in part because if we're serious about this sort of adopting scientific methodology stuff, um, then if you think about what happens in science, the way that science works is not, <laughs> let's ask one question and then look at all the data and see if we can keep answering that question with the data. The way that science works is like, we have a question, we have some data, we're trying to theorize about it. We come up with new questions that we think that we need to answer. Um, and there's no reason that we should have complete, wildly different methodology when it comes to those new questions that we have to answer. So there just, in fact, are other questions that we might want to ask about this data. Um, okay. Uh, 
the rest of this talk is really about like my love-hate relationship with Kant. I'm not going to mention his name again. Um, there are a lot of different ways we could like divide up this data if we wanted to think about questions that we might ask about it. And one of the ways, the salient one for us, is something like, does the data come from us, or is it about us, or, um, or on the other hand, does it come from the roughly mind and language independent world? Um, Note, this is an artificial divide. I believe this is an artificial divide. I don't think we can like escape ourselves and um, you know take the view from nowhere and like not be sort of embodied human beings who are stuck in the mind and language dependent world. Um, but still, it's important to note that like we talk as though we can do this all of the time. One of the places in which we do that is in science. Um, we also do that for better or for worse in metaphysics all the time. Um, and so I think it's important to think about what happens if we like take this divide more seriously. Um, okay. There's another sort of half a divide that's not on your handout, um, which I don't know how to like place within this divide that I'm talking about, but the half a divide is between um, sort of reality as it manifests itself to us and reality underneath the appearances. So you might think reality as it manifests itself to us belongs on the us side of this divide, or you might think it belongs in the mind and language independent world um, side of the divide because like we can make detached observations about it in the same way that we can make detached observations about fundamental physics or something. Um, by this I just mean like the way reality ordinarily appear, appears to us, not like anything else. Um, okay, so I'm not sure how to place that in this divide that I'm trying to make, but it's another distinction that I want to think about. Um, okay, and I think there's Motivation for separating our data this way, if you start thinking about specific kinds of questions you might ask that are sort of closest friends about each side of the data. So um, con contrast like empirical descriptive data about how we reason, that's about the us side of things, from empirical data about the mind and language independent world, that's on the world side of things. Um, in lots of cases, closest sort of pairs of questions are going to differ quite a bit here. So here are two pairs of, sorry, here's one pair of questions that I think is going to differ. Um, what's the logical structure of our reasoning? And what is the logical structure of physical reality? Um, I think, and I will try to keep motivating this, though it's all very sketchy. Um, I think unless you're like a hyper-rationalist or an idealist, you should think that these questions are going to have radically different answers. So if you're like a hardcore rationalist, then you should think one is a really good, whatever the answer to one is, is a really good guide to whatever the answer to two is. Um, and if you're an idealist, I mean, maybe not all, like, this is very general, but like you should think that the answer to one sort of determines the answer to two. Huh. Um, okay. So I think that this gives us a reason to think of, to take this divide seriously because I think most of us are not hardcore rationalists or idealists. Um, some of us are, I might be, I'm not sure, but most of us I think are not. Um, and so I think we should take this seriously as a way of like thinking about a way to split up our data and the kinds of questions we might ask about. Um, okay, in section seven, I'm going to quickly, I'm going to do a few things, but one of them that's not written down anywhere on your handout um, is that I'm going to try to motivate the idea that like there's an important question about logic in metaphysics that has nothing to do with validity. Um, I think that question arises in other domains as well, um, but I'm a metaphysician, so I'm going to talk about metaphysics. Um,
I'm going to do some other things too, but since that one's not on your handout, I'm, I thought I'd mention it. Um, okay, so Shamik Dasgupta, he no longer believes this, but he used to have this view, which is quite hard to understand. Um, the view is called generalism, and properly understood, the view is that the world is nothing but a single holistic fact. Um, now, on this view, the single holistic fact is decomposable into smaller facts. Um, so, for example, there is some fact in the very rough ballpark of the fact that I'm giving a talk right here, and that's obviously not a giant holistic fact. Right? Um, but that fact, whatever it is, is not decomposable into anything else. So there are no objects instantiating properties. Um, that's the crucial thing. Okay. Um, there are no entities to quantify over on the view. There's no sense to be made of predication or quantification at all. Um, now, in order to sort of have a language for his view, he borrows um, this predicate functories language from Quine. Um, and some of you are probably familiar with this. I'm just going to quickly, very quickly, go through um, how it works, just because it helps you get inside the view a little bit. So um, we've got a bunch of terms of the form PN. They denote property, and denote, N denotes the addicity of the properties. By the way, there's a sense in which there are no properties on this view, so it's weird to say this, but you'll see what's going on in a minute. Um, We've got these six term functors that allow us to sort of manipulate the property term. So negation and con conjunction are similar to the negation and conjunction we know. There's a permutation um, one. Uh, oh, I didn't put all of them on here. Um, uh, the important one we'll, call, we'll just call C. C is a filler of slots in properties. Okay, so if L2 is the two-place property of loving, which, by the way, does not exist on this view. There is no two-place property of loving. But if, so think about it this way. If L2 were the two-place property of loving, um, CL2 is the property of being loved by someone. CCL2 is the zero-place property of someone loving someone. Um, however, there are no someones. So the... There's, there's not anything filling in those slots. It's just a way of expressing this fact that doesn't involve any individuals. Um, CCL2. And then we've got this primitive expression, obtains. And so in order to state a fact um, and in order to state something well-formed, um, we say things like CCL2 obtains. And that gives us the sort of generalist equivalent of the fact that someone loves someone. The only difference is there are no someones. OK. Um, all right, so one thing to note here, and this just has to do with the validity issue, is like there is an equivalence between um, the kinds of inferences that Dasgupta wants to make um, in this language and something much more familiar, which is just like predicate logic with identity and without any individual um, constants. And he, he like it really cares about showing that basically there's like a validity equivalent, uh, equivalence here between these two things. And so the reason that he's using this language um, is because there's something that the other language, the predicate language, with, sorry, predicate logic with quantifiers, and identity, but without individual constants, is missing out on in describing this view. And the thing that it's missing out on is it's getting the structure of reality wrong. Huh. Um, because it's using quantification when there is no quantification in the world. Um, there's nothing to quantify over. Okay. So that's just to say, like, 
this part of things is meant to motivate the idea that we can ask questions about logical structure that don't have anything to do with validity. Um, I think the anti-exceptionalist should care about such questions. Um, okay, but that's not really the main thing I want to talk about. The main thing I want to talk about is this. Um, I think it would be illegitimate for us to import what we know about logic um, from other questions or other sources of data into thinking about fundamental reality if this kind of view were true. Um, and Import what we know is a really strong claim. Um, here's a version that uh, is in some sense weaker. Um, I think it's completely wrong for us to take into consideration at all anything that we know about the us side of the world um, when it comes to logic when we're thinking about the world side of the world. Um, Okay, so hence the relevance of my quote from Halverson. Um, I'm constructing the rules and the formalism once I have the metaphysical picture in mind without interference from what we know from the us side of things about logic. Um, okay, so lesson one is supposed to be importing things we know about logic is dangerous since there are so many different things that logic is used to explain and do. And crucially, some of the things we know about logic are things we know about the us, us side. Other things are things we know about the world side. Um, and at least not with great care, I don't think we should be taking those things into consideration on either side of the divide. Um, OK. Here is another lesson. Um, if generalism were true, I think we shouldn't change our logic or our ordinary reasoning about the world. So if generalism were true, we should not adopt predicate functories to talk about what we're doing right now, for example. Um, okay, why should we not do that? Because it's completely irrelevant to us. It's completely completely irrelevant to the way we perceive things in ordinary life. So we per perceive things in a sort of object instantiating properties kind of way. Um, that's how the manifest image works. Um, it's also completely irrelevant to the way that we reason about the ordinary world. Um, so even if it were to turn out that we wanted like an entirely new consequence relation for our logic of fundamental reality, that should have no bearing on what logic we use in everyday life. So this is just to say we shouldn't carry over things that we know about the logic of fundamental reality, if there is anything that we could know, <laughs> um, into uh, how we think about ourselves as agents in the world. Because ourselves as agents in the world and everything that we see and do and all this stuff has literally nothing to do with that. Um, okay, so basically I want to suggest if it were false that there were objects instantiating properties in the world, um, it would follow that all of our utterances outside of the ontology room um, or the physics room <laughs> um, would be strictly speaking false. Um, that's one way to go, there are other ways to go. But even if they're strictly speaking false, I don't see any normative pressure. Maybe I don't even see a descriptive possibility, so I'm not sure that we're the kind of beings that can do whatever it takes to understand reality in whatever way it ends up being fundamentally structured. Um, I don't see a lot of pressure normatively. I'm not sure there's a descriptive possibility for us to do that. And even if there is a lot of normative pressure for us to do that, um, I think the sort of pragmatic pressure to be able to move through the world and communicate with one another and deal with life um, would far swamp any normative pressure to speak that way. Um, compare, like, we still talk about the world in roughly Newtonian and Euclidean ways all the time, um, even though 
the world is neither Newtonian nor Euclidean. Um, okay, now I'm not sure I like the way I put this on the handout because I think the more and more I think about this, the more I'm like close to being a dualist about things. So I think a better way to put it is just like, look, forget about trying to claim that strictly speaking, it's false that things are as they appear to us. And just think like, what's true about the world that we inhabit is wildly different from what's true about fundamental reality. Um, okay, what follows from this? So the idea is like if some really weird fundamental metaphysical or physical theory is true, which even if you hate metaphysics, I think we can all recognize in the physical case, whatever is true, it's really weird. Um, uh, we have kind of a strong reason to think that we shouldn't carry data across the division, um, or sorry, we shouldn't ask questions that kind of cross the division about logic, because there's no reason to think that there's going to be any kind of unified thing that we're capturing when we try to bridge that divide with our questions. Um, okay. I also want to suggest that anti-exceptionalists should be particularly committed to this, at least if they have consistent methodology across all of philosophy. Um, so if the anti-exceptionalist picture says that logic isn't special, then it shouldn't be special in this very particular respect, um, which is it shouldn't be like the rationalist glue that's holding fundamental reality and manifest reality together. That would be very strange. Um, it's not strange at all if you're a rationalist, but I think if you're a rationalist, you shouldn't be an anti-exceptionalist about logic. Um, okay. What about validity? I said some of this before, but if the kind of dualist picture of reality underneath the appearances and manifest reality is true, not in that they're two utterly separate things, but in that what's true of one doesn't carry over to the other, um, then I just don't see any reason to think that something special about logical consequence or validity or anything. So I think this is obvious if you think about the kind of logical structure question that I was trying to ask. Um, like it's obvious that if this predicate functories is the right way to think about fundamental reality, that does not entail that that has any bearing at all on how we go about our lives. Um, but I think if, you're, if you can get yourself in the headspace of believing all that stuff, then it's like strange to think <laughs> there's going to be this special consequence thing that carries over between the two of them. Um, okay. Jeez, I've been talking for a long time. Um, here's another lesson. Sorry, this is all in form of lesson and thesis and <laughs> no arguments. <laughs> There's some arguments, but they're not like stated as arguments. Um, so here's a lesson. It's a bad making feature of a metaphysical theory. By that I mean specifically a metaphysical theory of reality underneath the appearances. If it imports facts about logic that we think we already know. Why? Because doing so is ruling out and a priori ruling out um, metaphysical theories that don't share logic with our other sources of logical data. Um, now, I don't think it's obvious that anyone is doing that, but again, I think the weaker version of this is done all the time, where the weaker version is like, this stuff, this stuff that we think we know about logic on the us side of things ha has some important thing to say on the metaphysics side of things. And if you're an anti-exceptionalist, maybe you should think like, maybe you should think, if you have that view, oh, but you know, it's revisable and I can trade it off against other considerations and stuff like that. Um, but what I'm trying to suggest is that I'm not even sure about that move at all. So I'm not sure that there's any sense in which it has a bearing on fundamental reality. Um, okay, maybe a lot of anti-exceptionalists will balk at this talk of fundamental reality. Um, or fundamental metaphysics, sorry, but presumably they care about physics since some extremely weird 
physical theory is very likely true, even if we don't know which one, um, then unless you're a scientific anti-realist, or maybe even if you are, you should still kind of be worried about this issue. Um, okay. And this issue, I think, has been talked about a lot in metaphysics in some sense. Um, but I'm trying to think about it in this other context. Okay. You might have thought that was like the weird part of the talk, but actually <laughs> this is the weird part of the talk. Um, it's a kind of diagnosis part of the talk. So, and it's about this idea that there's something wrong with making the consequence relation up as we go along if we're metaphysicians. And I think in this part of the talk, it's a little harder to get on board unless you think like metaphysicians are actually doing something remotely meaningful. Um, but we'll see. Okay, so I think it seems intuitively obvious that there's something really bad about making our consequence relation up as we go. Um, where that means something like, you know, I think what Williamson means here is like every time someone lodges an objection against a view that you have, instead of addressing the, the objection, you're like, oh, I'm going to change my logic. Um, now, of course, like, if, if you're an anti-exceptionalist, like, that move should be on the table. But the problem is if that's like the central move that you're always making, and I, I think this is what he's accusing some metaphysicians of, um, then something seems like it's gone wrong. Okay. Um, I think it's like clearly true on the us side of things that something's gone wrong if we do that. So I think if we're having a conversation and I just keep uttering things that don't, it's a slightly argumentative conversation, and I keep uttering things that don't at all follow from the things I've said before, and every time you like call me on it, I'm like, oh, but I just switched my consequence relation. Um, <laughs> that's like not a move that we're allowed to make. Um, but I want to float this idea that things are different in metaphysics. Um, and the reason I think things might be different in metaphysics is that I think that the process of developing metaphysical theories is largely up to us in a way that it's not always largely up to us in other contexts. So the process of developing a theory of like rationality, I do not think is largely up to us. Um, now, this idea of things being up to us has been talked about a lot in the philosophy of imagination because um, like Wittgenstein and Sartre thought like <laughs> there's a problem <laughs> with the idea that we could get knowledge or justification from imagination because imagination is up to us in this important way. Basically, we as agents like guide what we imagine and so how could that tell us anything about the world? Um, now, I don't want to get into that discussion. There are lots and lots of people who are trying to like push back on that idea. Um, but I think that the process of developing a metaphysical theory is up to us in a very similar way to the way that imagination in general is up to us. Um, and that's because I think that metaphysics is essentially imaginative. Um, both I and sort of Gideon Rosen have like current things defending this view, but I'm not going to say that much more about it. Um, but the idea here is this, like nothing should stop us from developing a logical structure, a consequence relation for our theories at the same time as we're developing the theory, um, if we're anti-exceptionalists, uh, because we're not bound by respecting some supposed a priori analytic logical truths. Um, we're allowed to revise our logic. And this suggests to me that like, if it turns out that Dasgupta's predicate functories didn't appropriately capture the view he intended, he shouldn't just throw up his hands and be like, oh well, um, he should get a new logic. Um, and I think this is true even if the problem is he needs a new consequence relation. And I think the up to us sense of this is like, <laughs> 
Um, he's the one, now you might think this is something that's wrong with metaphysics, which I think a lot of people do. Um, but he's the one who's sort of determining what the constraints on the view are supposed to be in the first place. Of course, he has this other obligation to try to convince other people of the view. But in terms of sort of developing the view itself, um, he's the one who gets to decide what kinds of constraints he's going to respect. And I think that's quite different from um, the way that things work in many other realms. Um, Okay, so claim. <laughs> um, treating logic, I'm gonna talk about the context of discovery and the context of justification like Ethelin did. Um, so treating logic as continuous with science has to also respect that there's a context of discovery and a context of justification. And I think this is true even if you think that distinction is artificial, which I do. So um, what do I mean by that distinction? Everybody means something different by it. I, here's a loose description of it. Um, context of discovery is like conceiving of new ideas. Um, it involves a sort of non-rational step or insight or imagination um, and possibly like a leap of faith. Um, the context of justification involves like applying evaluative criteria to theories, knowledge, justification claims. Um, okay, there's no agreement about how we should carve up the context of justification and context of discovery stuff. But um, one of the things that I want to suggest is that um, an awful lot, I think this is sort of changing a little bit, but an awful lot of like contemporary analytic philosophy of science only cares about the, con the context of justification and nothing else. Um, and my sense is that um, this has been inherited a little bit by anti-exceptionalists. Um, what I think is like one of the specific benefits of anti-exceptionalism that should be drawn out more is that in the context of discovery, it's like one less constraint in where we can go when we're making our leap of faith. Um, so a lot of the focus is on epistemology, methodology for epistemology, um, but I'm not sure that this counts as epistemology. This is some kind of like creative move. I think you should care about it even if you don't care about metaphysics because it's a creative move that is really important in science as well. Which is like, I'm gonna have this like conceptually brand new idea that's completely, not completely, but that's like radically divorced from the way people have been thinking about this particular thing. So a benefit of anti-exceptionalism is that there are fewer rules when we go to do that. Um, if you think that logic is a priori, um, if you think that logical truths are analytic, if you think that we can't revise logic, and so on, then a constraint on your ability to make that jump, uh, I mean, presumably the a priori constrains <laughs> the jump you can make or should constrain the jump that you can make, um, and the analytic constrains the jump that you can make or should constrain the jump that you can make. Um, so if we get rid of those things, then there's more room for us to come up with new stuff. Um, okay, but there's like a messiness problem here, which is I think that most people these days don't think there's a neat distinction between the context of discovery and the context of justification in science. Um, and just for example, like an evaluative, an, an evaluative process might like provide new insight into a theory and have someone come up with in response to like an objection uh, different in some kind of radical way but still um, having the same core as theory in response to the objection. And you might think that that's a process in which there's both context of, there's both discovery and justification going on, right? Um, okay, so 
sometimes like this stuff's happening all at once. We're trying to come up with the best theories here. Um, and if logic is revisable just like the rest of our theory is, then sometimes the best response to an objection might be to change the logic of the theory. Um, and sometimes that's, here's like what's crucial, sometimes that's going to have to be done in an unjustified way. This is not on the handout. Should be on the handout. So one of the things that's important about the context of discovery is like, it's your leaps of faith don't have to be justified by what you have in front of you. Um, and so the idea is like maybe what's going on in metaphysics is there's an awful lot of context of discovery. There's very little context of justification. Um, you might think that's a problem for metaphysics. I think that's a problem for metaphysics. However, one of the benefits of metaphysics is like that there is so much context of discovery and you can make these leaps of faith and then come to justify them later. And one way that you might come to justify them later is by being like, I've got this idea about how things are and I want to make my logic match my idea of how things are. And so what I need to do is make my consequence relation and my structure up as I go along because I'm just using logic as a tool to sort of aid my imaginative creation. Um, okay, so again, you might think like uh, you hate metaphysics, but I think that so, like a lot of this is going on in science. It's just like messier and there's more um, involvement of the context of justification side of things. Um, but I still think it's something that we might want to keep in mind. Um, maybe making our consequence relation up as we go is sometimes a crucial feature of theorizing about the world side of things. That's supposed to be the lesson there. Um, okay, so here's the summing up part. If we like the anti-exceptionalist view, we shouldn't object to people revising the logic of their theories as they go. Um, now, there's a sense in which, yeah, all anti-exceptionalists already believe this, but I mean it in a much stronger <laughs> sense. Um, this might be particularly true in metaphysics, where it's unclear how the context of justification works. And some people, like myself and Rosen, think maybe what's going on here is metaphysics is basically just all context of discovery, and there's no justification to be had. Um, Anti-exceptionalists have particularly strong reasons not carry what we know about logic across the us-world divide, um, and not just like what we know in the sense that we're holding this thing fixed and bringing it over to the other side, but what we know in the sense that like this is what accurately describes the data over here, and so I'm going to import it onto the other side and take it as a theoretical consideration on the other side. Um, maybe there's something wrong with doing that. That's the main thing that I've trying, been trying to push um, in this talk. Okay, so if you think that's right, which I suspect not very many of you do, um, then one thing that is relevant for people who care about the logical issues more is like, is whether we should ever take sort of fundamental physical theories or metaphysical interpretations of fundamental physical theories that we really like to give us any insight whatsoever into the thing that <laughs> we on the, the us side of things, which I think most philosophers of logic, that's what they care about, um, that that would give us any insight whatsoever into how we should think about logic on the us side of things. Okay, I'm going to stop there.